I think everyone's here. Thank you so much, everyone, for coming. I think some people will be trickling in slowly as well. Um, we should just get started because everyone who's here uh, is here and we're really glad to have you. Um, before we get started, I just wanted to say we're gathering here today uh, to share a conversation on the sacred lands of the Wurundjeri and Woiwurrung people of the Greater Kulin Nations. I pay my respects to the elders and custodians of these lands, past, present and future, and extend this respect to our First Nations colleagues and friends in the room with us today. Sovereignty on these lands has never been ceded and we're privileged to be held by the traditions of storytelling, knowledge sharing, care, exchange and vulnerability that has existed here for a long time before any of us and bring this grounding into the room as we listen to the practices and stories of the artists, thinkers and makers here with us, which is all of, all of you. Um, and we do this with tenderness and responsibility towards the history that precedes us. So thank you, everyone. Um, just to introduce the day, um, this is a conversation series that we, when we were thinking about the festival this year, we thought would be a really lovely addition to the festival. We have not done this before. Um, to bring the artists together and have an opportunity for all the artists who are participating in the festival to speak to their practices. So we're really excited to do that. Um, we have four talks planned for the day, so people can come to all four or one or two or three. So it was very much choose your own adventure <laughs> type of a situation. Um, so um, we a little bit of housekeeping actually before we get started. There are uh, bathrooms right outside the, the door. Um, there, there's some food for you to help yourselves to. Please, uh, please feel free to um, have some of those delicious things. Um, this is being recorded for archival purposes only. <laughs> um, so it's very casual. I know that can be a bit intimidating sometimes. Um, and also for those who don't drink coffee, I've been told to let everyone know there's a small tea tab at Padre <laughs> if you did want to go get some tea instead of coffee. Um, I do also invite everyone uh, to stay, even if you have only come here for one session. There are four really lovely conversations that have been planned, so you are more than welcome to stay for the entire day as well. Uh, big thank you to Shannon, who's not in the room, who is allowing us to use his space from Composite, um, and Collingwood Yards as well. So uh, the first conversation is titled A Soft Pulse, which is the title of the festival. Um, it's a wonderful title that we've come up with, um, with um, Eleanor Shikitano, who is our curator here. Um, I'll just read a little bit about what that is about. Um, a soft pulse invites artists to celebrate and examine a spectrum of care, from love through to resistance, vulnerability through strength. Um, Eleanor and I will reflect on this curatorial rationale and the festival framework and invite the artists in the first conversation to speak to their practice. Um, and we're joined today by Jen Valinder, Henry Wolf, and Anne Wagner uh, for the conversation about a soft pulse. Um, Eleanor is our curator. Just a quick introduction for Eleanor. Eleanor is a Ghana country, Adelaide-based independent curator and writer and current director of Post Office Projects, a new volunteer-run studio and gallery space located in Port Adelaide. Shigitano's curatorial practice commonly involves working with artists to explore the body, gesture and identity. More recently, her attention has turned to frameworks of care and responsibility. Eleanor. Thank you. I just need to oh, sorry, that one. Thanks, Priya. It's great to be here today. Nice to see everyone. So I'm just going to quickly introduce the artists speaking today. Just let me find where I wrote down everyone's... Beautiful. So Jen Valander, to my left here, is an Aotearoa-born, Nam-based, Nam Melbourne-based artist. Uh, Jen works with moving image and performance to express her interest in ethics and coexistence. She has exhibited in galleries and public spaces in Australia, France, South Africa, and Portugal, and holds an MFA research from the Victorian College of the Arts at the University of Melbourne. Henry Wolfe. Uh, is based in Tantania, Adelaide. Henry Wolfe's practice is concerned with images that articulate vulnerability in their participation with the worlds of their collaborators. With an empathetic observational methodology, they produce moving image, photographic and performance works 
that through attention to human connection, explore entangled experiences of being and foster the moral virtues of compassion, care and love. And finally, Anne Wagner. So Anne is an, is an educator in the art design and architecture department at Monash University and a NAM-based spatial architect whose work navigates dreamscapes as an aeronaut. Her practice takes an auto-ethnographic approach and encompasses her felt eco-angst through dream, time and our internet landscape to create new spatial realities. Oh, and I'd just like to invite each of the artists to talk about their work in the festival and how that relates to ideas of care and the curatorial rationale, um, perhaps starting with you, Jen. Thank you. Hello, everyone. It's so great to be here. Um, so my work in the festival is titled um, Sensing the Other in Whatever Form It Comes, and it features a gorgeous Aberdeen Angus cow licking um, its handler's hand, and it's this very soft, very gentle, very intimate moment between um, two female beings. And I was really inspired by the, the site that I was assigned for the festival. It's this gorgeous circle um, on the front of Ends and Means Bar. And it made me immediately think of um, a microscope or a telescope um, or a petri dish or that really sort of close um, experience of focusing in and looking. Um, it even a little more cynical. It looks, <laughs> it looks even like um, looking down the barrel of a gun. And um, those are the types of things I was thinking of when I was making the work. And um, after thinking about the barrel of the gun, I was thinking about um, westerns and how the scene really referenced a lot of the spaghetti westerns that I loved watching as a child. And um, so that really informed the color palette, those uh, sort of uh, grainy um, yellows and those types of things. And I love the idea of the um, trope of the, the cowboy hero being sort of turned on its head with these two mothers that are in this really gorgeous moment of getting to know one another through taste and touch. Yeah. Hi, everyone. Um, so my work that's part of the festival is called Lacrimal. It's a multi-channel moving image piece with um, underwater scenes that feature two uh, queer people in kind of embraces and kind of moments that reach towards these kind of embraces and connection and coming together, particularly around desire and how these kind of wet bodies can move towards these kind of states of connectedness or potentially transformation. Um, the piece uh, has come together as a four-channel work for the festival, which I find as been a quite powerful installation being on like four glass windows and you kind of get this quite immersive kind of experience with it but um, it's been a long time coming with putting it together it's it's been about a year to develop the project but um, have had the chance to work with some incredible people to actually bring that together um, but thinking about the context of the festival and the kind of idea of softness and vulnerability and that's something that runs quite strongly throughout a lot of the works that I produce, that this idea that vulnerability is a state of, or, or a position of power, I guess, that taking risks in kind of particularly our connections with one another um, gives us these opportunities to transform our experiences of existence of one another, of, of everything. But yeah, I think that's a good kind of intro to the work and we can probably flesh it out further as we go. Thank you. Awesome. Um, hello. Um, my short film is called Am I Awake Now? Um, and I had the pleasure of making it with um, a mentor called Billy Raffin, who actually has a work here as well through the Signal Arts... Um, uh, what do you call it? Yeah, Signal Arts program. Um, I made it during lockdown, so lots of at home in my bedroom making. Um, and I bought myself an uh, overhead projector and was just fascinated through layering, through combining the analog and the digital. And um, I absolutely love the invert tool and just making things like a dream. And yeah, I call myself a one renaught, which is a person that investigates their own dream landscapes. Um, and I guess that's where the soft, vulnerable aspect comes in. Um, I believe dreams are quite yeah, a very interesting part that, um, that reflects perhaps internal 
things that we haven't processed or um, things that we're not facing during our waking time. And yeah, I've just been recording my dreams for I think five years and a lot of things that emerge are um, anxieties about the future and our planet. And that is uh, some things that I touch on in that short film. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Anne. Much we need to uh, speak of that we could unpack so much in each one of your works. Um, I guess one thing I was really interested in hearing a little bit more about is uh, the intimacy in each one of your works and the framework of intimacy. Like you're speaking about dreams and you're talking about wading through tears and water, and that I know we've spoken about that in other contexts as well. And Jen, the otherness with the and the texture of that cowlick with the hand of the farmer. Um, that how does that translate for you in that public space now that you've seen it in this public space this they're, they're really deeply intimate works does that make sense yeah it does and i really loved um hearing people's feedback actually um uh, particularly the different readings of the work like some people found that the the realities of this bodily interaction was actually quite abject and disgusting and i also appreciate that as well as it sometimes you know, things that other people see as beautiful or natural can be also quite confronting. Um, so that was something really special that came out of the work for me in terms of seeing it in a public space and getting feedback. Yeah. And for myself, because the work um, touches on very personal kind of um, narratives around particularly relationship deterioration for myself, um, it's a weirdly exposing and... Um, cathartic experience sharing it in a public space like that. Um, different to sharing kind of works of, because I have a lot of works that carry quite strong personal narratives, but um, a lot of them have been presented in much more closed spaces, gallery spaces, where I guess it's more of a kind of uh, a controlled space. In this environment, it's very much out there and it's there for people to consume in whatever capacity they feel is right for them, which I think is a wonderful thing about public works, but it's a different kind of intimacy, a different kind of relationship to your own vulnerability. I have to be honest, I haven't gone seeing my work yet. <laughs> I haven't had the time, but tonight is the night, and uh, it is a bit nervous, like having something projected so big, but um, being with like 19 other artists on that street, that's amazing. Um, yeah, it may be because um, I investigate through an order ethnographic approach. Um, yeah, maybe m mainly I know what I'm experiencing, but maybe through the through the film, people can relate through dreamlike uh, feelings of things not making sense or merging and blending and just shifting to a whole another concept or location and. Um, in the future, I would really love to expand that and uh, dive into other people's dreams, a collective dreaming project, maybe. Yeah. Your work looks amazing, Anne. <laughs> <laughs> I'd love to hear what you think when you see it. <laughs> yeah. um, thank you. Um, I like this idea of exploring collective dreams in the future as well. I think that's really wonderful. I'd love to see where that lands for you. Um, Me too. Um, Henry, I would love to hear a little bit more from you about what you were saying just then about um, that intimacy and how that's being read in a public space um, as well because, as you say, it's not a controlled environment and it, it can sometimes also have a billboard-like quality to it as well. It's your work is a four-channel work on a really long strip of windows as well. Um, it's, abs it's, it's stunning, it's poetic, it's um, the water when you see bodies interact with the water and the effervescence of it and the floating quality of it. Um, it's, it's, it's a very uncontrolled environment, but it's absolutely stunning. But how does, what comes up for you when you see that? Like, after having been, I know the process that you have been through in making the work. Like my immediate reactions to it or, or more so the kind of like, uh, because I think like immediately it was quite um, a weird sensation finally actually getting to that point of it being a tangible kind of presentation of this work that's been kind of coming together for such a long time. Um, and particularly like, being 
immersed in that creation process of the work with the kind of framework of, of as I said, it's quite personal. It's got, there's a bit of sadness to it with the kind of reasoning and rationale behind it. Equally, there's some wonderful things about imagining what queerness can be and what those kind of queer relationships can be when you kind of really risk that kind of connection with one another. But um, I think all in all, it's um, it's been quite a wonderful experience to actually kind of see it come together like it has. Um, like I think that the it's it's interesting with the glass, how you get a different kind of quality of projection from the rear and particularly with water as a liquid, glass as a liquid, mm -hmm. both of them as very kind of queer materials in themselves as well, that it's this beautiful kind of coming together of material and content. And I love, I think some of the things that I've loved is seeing those kind of figures and those forms because you've got such a depth of field kind of almost kind of swim out towards you to meet you as an audience member as you're kind of moving along the street. And I mean, you can choose to stop and, uh, and take it in as much as you feel comfortable with. And I think that that's one of the wonderful things that I've seen is that there's people engaging with it in different ways to different levels. Like there'll be people that will just walk straight past or there'll be people who not knowing that it was there will come around the corner and like double take on it, which is, is kind of an interesting thing to watch. And it's also weird watching people watching it, but um, <laughs> <laughs> um, it's, um, yeah, it's a wonderful experience because I've also never done a four channel work on that kind of scale. So it's quite an incredible thing to realise that kind of that kind of scale of a project. For me, one of my favourite things when we were installing was um, the first trial preview that we did um, was people were exactly the double take and then crossing the street and looking at it and, and being really confused but also really curious and then running back to us and asking us what was going on and there was this really incredible conversation that happened through that curiosity which is happening for all the works and it's really yeah it's quite exciting um, um, uh, yeah um, something that I was wanting to talk about was the collaboration that exists in each of your works um, because especially you know Henry your work you can see you can see the people and you could they could be identified um, and then Jen with your work how you've built up that trust with the farmer and kind of found those moments and then the um, mentorship that you've been doing, Anne. And I wondered if you could just speak a little bit more about how you approach, how you approach those relationships and what it means to, um, to work in that way, perhaps. Yeah, um, for me, that relationship sort of found me and I like, I like that um, approach where um, I meet people and we develop a friendship and then it turns out that they have this interesting um, component of their lives and are willing to share it with me um, and with everyone who sees the artwork. Um, and in that work, there was several sort of relationships happening because the farmer, Pam, had raised that calf from, um, that cow from a calf after its mother had abandoned it. And um, so from that, they had this really beautiful bond where the cow was almost behaving like a domestic dog would. So it would be called and it would run and be quite joyful. And she's a cattle farmer and I found that, that really um, striking how she could have this bond with this particular cow because of that, that lengthy interaction. Um, and that cow will never go to a processing farm. That's, you know, it's her, it's her um, not a pet, but it's her sort of friend and, and companion. Um, so learning that and then um, getting to know Pam and, and developing those relationships and being on site and just listening and talking, that's how I generally appro approach collaboration. So quite a long, quite a long process. It can be. Yeah. Um, it depends on the people as well. I mean, it's an ongoing process. So even after the project ends, um, it'll be something that continues. Um, so, and it's also just gorgeous to be able to share it with them. Yeah. So they'll be coming um, into Melbourne. Oh, brilliant! I was going to ask, the are they going to come yeah. and see? <laughs> yeah. Well, um, well, yeah. Bring tomorrow. the cow. That would be amazing. Yeah. Hmm. Um, 
And Henry, I know in the past you've worked a lot with your community. Um, and how did you, yeah, how you carried that into um, into Lacrimal and how uh, how the performances, the performers, sorry, maybe have sort of reacted to the very public nature of the work? Um, well, in, in general, collaboration is such a strong point of my practice that um, I don't think my works would actually exist without that kind of um, framework. Um, that uh, I don't see myself as a sole author in these works. That, for example, with Lacrimal, that um, there is there's actually no way that I can fully control that kind of performance because I'm outside of the water while that's happening or I'm at a distance from this. So it's this kind of touch point between cinematographer, myself and the performance, this kind of, this nexus that happens as a result of that is what the performance is in the piece. But, um, uh, and my kind of attitudes and understandings and, uh, and approach to collaboration has very much come from um, mentoring from some incredible kind of artists and some incredible people. Um, I won't put any names out there, but a lot of love to them. <laughs> um, but, uh, um, the kind of reaction, I think, has been from the actual performers, the, the two guys that are in the work, has been, like, varied, I guess. They're both, they're, they're both very close friends of mine. They're um, a beautiful um, queer couple that um, I find a lot of power and strength from as well as, as close friends of mine. But um, uh, as is the case with anything, that, like, people react to it differently. And I think that one of them's taken a kind of more cautious kind of position towards it, not because they feel uncomfortable with the work, but because they're just wary of necessarily how people consume their own image. Um, and I think that that's a very healthy kind of position to take in response to any images that are distributed within the public realm. But um, throughout the process, it's been a very clear kind of uh, articulation of what the work will look like, how it will be presented, um, they probably know more about the project than most people because I always, with my collaborators, check in at every point possible to make sure that they know where that work is at, what it's looking like, and so that they feel comfortable with how they're being represented. So, yeah. Brilliant, thank you. Um, and Anne, yeah, maybe just a little bit about that relationship that you had with your mentor and how that sort of... Um, helped to shape the work, perhaps? Yeah. Um, it was all during peak lockdown. Um, no in-person, nothing. It was all over Zoom. But it was very wholesome. And we each had mentors. And I got to pick Billy because I've met them through other things. And they have a similar aligned um, interests and dreams and internal landscapes. Um, so just got loads of readings and articles from them and um, that just inspired me and we had check-ins and workshops. Um, yeah, but I guess the rest of the collaboration was with myself, uh, trying to yeah set up a camera without a tripod and film myself and re-watch it and edit it and cringe it, but then also, yeah, but I did also have my amazing partner um, <laughs> there to jump in and be the camera person as well. Yeah. Um, that sounds really fun, that process. And that cringe moment, I really recognize that <laughs> cringe moment when you see yourself first on the, in the work. And yeah. um, Henry, I love what you were talking about how you create that care-based framework in the process of making but also sharing. It would be really lovely to hear from all of you actually a little bit more about that because even in your the way you're speaking about the way you were talking about Pam and the farmer and the hand and um, and your relationship with Billy and even yourself in that lockdown and how this work has helped and your work is about care towards the natural environment as well so how do you you know expand that into obviously how you're thinking about the work but also how you're making it and then sharing it if you could speak a little bit more about that that would be great um, what in terms of, uh, can you reframe the question? Yeah, of course. I guess <laughs> <laughs> um, I think I'm I'm um, alluding to there's a lot of care and tenderness in mm. the way you approach the work. Yes. Um, in in using the gestures that you are showing. Yeah. Um, and then also how you're sharing and, and inviting um, 
you know, uh, Pam mm. or oh, Pam's a cow? No, Pam mm. is not. Pam oh. is the farmer. Pam's the farmer, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> lucky, lucky is the cow. <laughs> so, yeah, inviting yeah. Pam to come yeah, see the yeah. work. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I want the cow to come and see the work, you know. Oh, so do um, I, yeah. <laughs> but you're inviting Pam into it and what does that mean? Mm. Because there's a lot of care and love there as well. Yeah, and there how, is. And that in an artistic practice, that is such a big part that doesn't mm. really get seen when you see the outcome as well so really trying to expand on that maybe a little bit yeah that's so true um and gosh pam was so beautiful and generous with her time um it was really wonderful spending um, a couple of days up on her farm and and also bonding with her cattle um like she has um i think i was really thinking about um after i had gotten to know her and her cattle then it was more an observational process. So that's where the looking came in and that's when I learned that that's how cows actually bond with not only each other but with humans. And um, I sort of also look at them as the ultimate um, giver, if you like, or provider. Um, you know, they're a sort of wet nurse for millions. Um, <laughs> you know, they provide fertilizer. Um, uh, what else, uh, you know, their hides are for clothing, shoes, etc. Their bones become jewellery and tools. Um, so thinking about them like that, they really are so symbolic and powerfully symbolic. Um, and those are the things that I was really being thoughtful of and mulling over when I was making the work. And I just wanted to find a way of communicating that. That was a really simple gesture. And um, I spoke deeply with Pam about it as well. Um, and, you know, I said to her, are you comfortable with your hand being in it and all of those things? And, um, you know, she, she was very, very welcoming to the idea. <laughs> Quite excited, actually. Yeah. Um, also, I just wanted you to share with everyone here, you were mentioning something the other night when we were talking about how cows have this sense of they identify people through tongue or something like that it was yeah a, well it was it's an information gathering exercise isn't it like for most animals yeah so um i think that's how they uh, they identify but they also they clean each other like that as well and if the herd is um um you know um, upset for whatever reason they'll comfort each other in that way so it's not it's not merely just a hello it's actually, it's actually got a lot of levels of communication yeah it's that language well, and that's language of care as well. If you haven't seen the work, when, when you see the work, you'll understand all this cow licking that <laughs> we're referring to. Uh, it's such a deceptively simple work, I think. Like, it is such a small... Like, it is that very small gesture, and I think it's, um, it's quite beautiful. And the longer you watch, the more you kind of reflect on... One of my first thoughts was, what is the relationship? And what... What is in this cow's future? <laughs> so I'm very happy to hear that the cow will be loved and nurtured and cared for forever and ever. <laughs> um, sort of um, turn the tasting back onto the farmer as well. Yeah. In a way. <laughs> yeah, and all the other ways that we... Um, like, I think sometimes we forget that uh, there are more... You know, there's more elements to communication than simple language, and it often is through gesture and movement and that kind of thing, especially when interacting with animals mm -hmm. as well. Absolutely. Yeah, and what we pick up from that. Um, well, that Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, just to uh, talk, speak a little bit more about that, Jen, the last work that we worked with you on, which ha also had a, an animal, mm -hmm. um, had the python in it. Um, and I know we've discussed this um, in that work, which was about that otherness that you're bringing into this, into your practice. Um, would you like to share anything about that? Because I think there's a lot of really juicy things in there. Yeah, I'd love to. Um, so I, I grew up in a household where my mother had a penchant for rescuing animals. So we had a lot of rescue cats, dogs. Um, we had, God, uh, frogs, rabbits, <laughs> um, rats, mice. We even had a lamb at one stage. It was like a strange sort of Noah's Ark in suburban Auckland. It was, it was a very unusual upbringing. Um, but because of that proximity with so many other um, beings, it really made me aware very early on um, of this sort of negotiation of space with other um, other uh, life forms. And that could be not just the non-human, but also the environment and, um, 
and so on and so forth. So I think I'm always thinking about that negotiation of space with, um, with the works that I'm doing at the moment, yeah. yeah. There's this beautiful quality because it's always talking about the non-human, you're constantly talking about the language of the non-human with the python as well, the teenage python and the teenage person, how they interact with each other. There's something quite powerful um, that happens in your imagery. I think that comes through. Um, that's quite bodily as well. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, Henry, I was just, um, while Jen was talking, I was just thinking about your other work as well, care as well, and you spoke a little bit about that, about how that's such a big part of your practice and relationships between bodies and how you bring that into your work. Um, I would love to hear a little bit more about that, if you would like to share a few things. Um, well, Care is another moving image project that I created in 2021. It was um, commissioned by Fine Print Magazine, who are an online kind of uh, artist space kind of curatorial platform, which is pretty awesome that it, because it was following on from um, uh, some uh, wonderful other kind of commissions in their program. But um, it gave me the opportunity to really kind of delve into those kind of ideas of how do you, uh, how do people share these kind of um, practices of care within their own kind of private universes. Um, so it was, it's, I see it as kind of a set of, of five vignettes, I guess, of different experiences of care where there's kind of essentially five different scenes that are kind of interwoven with one another um, of different kind of relationships of care where there's one, um, a really good close friend of mine who means the world to me, um, a mother and her two children. And then there's scenes of um, myself with my mum where um, there's me making, carrying my mum in a site that's called um, uh, the Hampstead Rehabilitation Centre, which is where she first started as a nurse. Um, so a, a lot of my practice, I think, is uh, when I talk about practices of care or practices of empathy within works, I think that that's not necessarily something that I actively kind of go, I'm going to make sure that I'm being caring or something like that. It's, it is quite very much a, a part of who I am in the sense of that's how I think that that's how you should practice. I, certainly you have to put effort into that and you have to be conscientious of how you maintain those processes and also maintain yourself so that you don't kind of run out of steam. But um, it's it's more like it's a second kind of, it's a pulse. Pardon the kind of pun, I guess, in the sense of the festival, but like it, it's very much something that if I know, uh, it's, it's a knowing that if, if you're doing the right thing by the people that you're working with, it's because you know that that's the right thing to do by those people to take care of them in these situations. Because uh, filming and photography, it's quite a, a, a full-on kind of process for people that you ask a lot of people when they're part of these kind of things because shoots can sometimes, for example, with Lacrimal, that was a day-long kind of shoot where... Uh, when you're doing underwater scenes, the, 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 the kind of the weight upon the body the, the is in intense because I even jumped in at one point because I wanted to understand what it was that I was asking as well these performers to do. So there's also footage of myself kind of being part of that kind of experience and you just become very exhausted very quickly. Simple things are very, very hard. Um, like I don't think any of us even managed to get to the bottom of the water that we were in because it was just too physically taxing. But it's about making sure that you're taking care and making sure that those people have support systems in those kind of spaces as well. So there was a full team, there was a safety diver, uh, actually two safety divers, I had assistance for myself as well. So it's, it's making sure that you put in structures to ensure that you can be as caring and, and have the space to be as um, empathetic as is possible. Yes, thank you. That was, um, it's also like when you talk about the, the exhaustion and the, the weight and there's also in the process of making as well, in filmmaking especially, it's almost like you have this directorial responsibility. So you have to create that framework where everyone feels safe. If something's not working, what do you do? It's, it's a big process. So um, yeah, thank you for sharing that, Henry. Um, did you have anything you wanted to ask Henry or Jen? Um, I, I yeah, sorry. <laughs> sorry. Um, I'm enjoying sitting here listening. It's really <laughs> lovely. Um, and I, I would love to, um, just to continue on from Jen and Henry, would love to hear a little bit more about 
the anxiety that you speak of in your work, it, was, it really struck for me when I was um, reading about your work and watching it as well, how you were talking about sleep and the relationship between sleep and anxiety and caring for land mm -hmm. through that and the dream space. Um, yeah, if you could tell us a little bit more about your interest there, that would be lovely. Yeah, for sure. Um, I probably said, yeah, I recorded my dreams way before I was a climate activist. And yeah, through the recording of dreams, I've started to identify patterns and those anxieties. Um, and I needed an outlet. I needed to do something about it. And I came across certain activist groups and uh, bonded and connected with amazing people. Um, yeah, and I guess that's how it emerged. I had documents and documents of all my dreams and I just didn't know what to do with them. Um, and yeah, I just wanted to create some kind of visual um, and that's what what emerged. Um, and I'm sure there's lots of other people that feel similarly about those topics, especially people, yeah, my generation. Um, yeah. Over, yeah, it's very hard to uh, do daily things uh, when you have a lot of worries about the future and, yeah, you start questioning, is this purposeful, is this worth it? Or, yeah, it can get really low. <laughs> um, should I have children? What, yeah, all those things. Um, and, yeah, recently I allegedly went to Sydney and... Um, uh, took part in activism and um, yeah, I met a, a friend and we were sharing a Airbnb and he just recently got out of um, custody because he got arrested for resisting and um, yeah, he was screaming and talking in his sleep um, and that just, yeah, it woke me up and startled me and I was like, wow, this is just, yeah, daily life and the things you care for um, merge with your subconscious unconsciousness and um, yeah, there's, yeah. It's an interesting thing with sleep, I think. It's often the cornerstone of any kind of self-care regime. Everyone's like, the first thing you need to do is get a lot of sleep and you need to start taking care of yourself. But if that sleep is interrupted or like quite a painful experience, it's... Yeah, it's hard to sort of know how to combat that, I guess. I just wanted to ask, because um, I'm just coming off the back of uh, a performance work that was very much based in kind of trance kind of stuff. So we had a lot of kind of visions and stuff. And I, I, I find it interesting, the kind of idea of like patterns and stuff like that with envisions, because uh, a reoccurring kind of uh, theme for myself was I would see um, this falcon that would visit me as part of these kind of experiences, and I, I wonder, uh, what kind of patterns do you find in these kind of these th these documents that you're uh, kind of taking of your dreams, and if that's kind of manifesting in any particular way? Yeah, yeah, that's a good question, um, and I don't know what a falcon means for you. I don't know how to <laughs> what I'll symbols mean. I think <laughs> yeah, <laughs> um, because I've been doing it for so long, I've like trained myself to be I guess lucid or conscious whilst dreaming and sometimes I wake up and I have like seven dreams recorded and it's just yeah a lot of content and some things I read over and the next day I'm like oh yeah I know why I dreamt that because I was stressing about this or um, sometimes you have people from your childhood appearing or embarrassing things or um <laughs> Um, but yeah, with the with anxiety, it's a lot of kind of loss that I experience of things um, disappearing, dying. Um, yeah, it's very because like with dreams, it's not just visuals; it's also your feelings. Um, I guess and it's very hard to <laughs> describe them, um, but it is like a heartbreaking feeling, or also like a drowning feeling which is why I incorporated a bit of uh, water and underwater footage in my dream uh, in, in my dream in my uh, film as well <laughs> I, 
and I think that is such a fascinating thing as well, like how differently you can experience them. Because I think with the performance that I've recently been doing, there was a th the three performers of us, and we all had very different ways of responding to the experience. Like some, one of us actually said that she became stars, she became lightning at points. So it's wonderful how differently you can experience and then translate those things. Um, and I also features quite heavily in your work and I just wondered what that sort of means to you and, and why that's there, maybe. Sorry, could you repeat the first two words? <laughs> oh, um, your eye. Oh my your eye. eye is quite featured in the work as well. Oh, it's not my eye. It's not your <laughs> eye. I thought it was your eye. No. Um, I guess that's the, the whole thing of trying to un underpick, like, depict what is what with all the layers, but it's actually a, a bowl of water sitting on top of the overhead projector and I'm pouring water into it and filming the projection. Ah, well that's beautiful. I don't know how I thought that was an eye. I'm going to have to go back and watch it again. <laughs> it does look like an eye when you see it. Um, yeah, it, I can see how you would see that as an eye. Yeah, <laughs> yeah an eye, a peek hole into something. That's really, so are you saying, Anne, you use the hardware of the projector to then actually um, shoot the scene itself? Is that, is that what you, is that, that's the eye of the? Yes, so yeah. the entire, well, the main thing, the frame is the filming of my room with the projector, projected projection of the <laughs> overhead projector. And then within the circle, I um, added things digitally into it. Oh, but some of that stuff is also through the overhead projector. That's very clever. That's very cool. Love that. <laughs> um, Henry, I, I was really, you since you brought it up, <laughs> the performances that you've been doing, I haven't witnessed them in person, but I have seen them through social media, and they are absolutely stunning. The breath work that you've been doing, it's quite incredible and how you would, uh, what you were just bringing up about the meditative quality of them as well. I would love to hear a little bit more about that, <laughs> if, if, if you would like, if it's Certainly. okay. Um, well, it's, it's part of a work by um, Melo Callahan, who is a, an Adelaide, uh, as Australian uh, born but Paris based artist, who has been um, brought on board as part of the um, Sam Stubb Museum's program. And it's a performance that's called, uh, it's a performance protocol that she's called Respire, Respire which um, looking at, uh, I can't remember what the uh, uh, researcher's name was, but it's a researcher from the 60s and 70s who really started a lot of the kind of um, understanding of um, uh, trance work and um, different kind of practices on how you kind of enter those kind of altered s states of being, I guess. Um, so this particular piece, it were, it, it's been... Uh, it's a 20 minute kind of performance where it's sustained breath work for 20 minutes. So there's three kind of intense blocks of constant like breathing on like a one beat. So it's like <laughs> for like 20 minutes, you're just going hard. Um, there's a, like a, a projection, um, installation and um, a, a musical score that's all combined as part of it. And there's three of us performers who do that piece with um, an audience present. Um, but essentially what happens as a result of that kind of process of the, the kind of rhythm, the kind of the deep kind of breathing, that your body um, essentially goes into hyperventilation. Um, you lose um, uh, blood flow to a certain extent, so your hands become like these foreign kind of uh, things that just like kind of feel like they're curling up and you, you start kind of losing kind of, uh, uh, not consciousness necessarily, but kind of your awareness or your inhibition about what the space and the people around you are. So you just kind of really dissolve into the work and um, by the end it gets that intense that you, um, you, you're in a trance state and you start slipping into visions. Um, for myself, as I was saying before, one of the reoccurring things that would happen would be that through kind of... Um, it was almost like black or white noise, this kind of falcon would appear with its face right in front of me as if it was gliding, holding this moment with me, which was quite intense because um, when you're in that kind of experience, it's, it's crazy to have that kind of moment with something holding you like that. But um, 
uh, as, as I said as well, that there was a varied kind of uh, uh, responses from across the performers that one would end up more often than not in a space of complete white light. And uh, another would kind of transform into kind of uh, these kind of alchemical things like lightning or as I said like stars and, and she would be aware of us around her and would say that we were becoming these materials as well or would even just be transported to different places like she ended up in a desert midway through one of the performances which sounds absolutely nuts <laughs> but like when you're actually doing it you become very aware of how quickly you can end up in these very weird kind of experiences because you've lost um, or you've sac uh, you've kind of um, allowed yourself to slip into this kind of zone where uh, your experience of the world changes. Mm -hmm. Oh, and Eleanor has uh, did actually see the last. I was going to say I was it, very yeah. lucky, and I actually saw the last one, and it's an interesting exercise. I think as an audience member as well, because I know all three of you reasonably well, um, but. It was, I was quite anxious as an audience member. I was like, oh, well, some this is. people can't watch the end of it. Some people no, can't because yeah. it gets so full on. Like I, I, both times that we performed, I cry in the end because you're just like, you, you're struggling to breathe. <laughs> yeah. And I think I, I'd seen all of you, I think, in the week before it as well. And I was just thinking, oh, those poor kids. They look so tired. Then when you start crying, you just want to get up and be like, I'm so sorry. Well, it's another, all okay. another friend because like, like it's physically taxing. Like one of us collapsed to their knees half uh, by mm. the, towards the end. Another like myself, I was staggering around the place, and a good friend was like, "Oh my god, I wanted to go grab her, but then I wanted to grab you, and I didn't know what to do." <laughs> you're in a real. Uh, you're in a real state of yeah, high anxiety. I think watching that performance. Um, and yeah, an incredible really experience. Absolutely beautiful experience, but yeah, quite interesting, especially in like a, a post-COVID world where there's a lot of heavy breathing going on, like a really interesting space to sit, to sit in, I think. And I think breath is such a relatable experience for everyone that you would feel that immediately, the trance quality that you're talking well, about. Well, you pull having. people into it essentially because they can't help but match the breathing in the space, which I think is actually a very interesting thing with um, the work that's in the festival right now, that I find that people, when they experience that the first time round, they get this sensation of holding their breath as well, which I think is a beautiful, or at least I know I certainly do still, which isn't a beautiful thing that works can do that to you. It's in all of your works, actually, uh, when we were walking through and going through each work uh, the other couple of nights ago. With your work, I think some, someone said that it's really interesting because water is not our natural state. While it is, it, we're constituted of water, but you don't, you know, see that. So your work really brings that up and makes you really feel that you're on the ground <laughs> and you're breathing air and how hard it can be to be underwater like that. So there's all of these other qualities that your work lends itself to as well. Um, does anyone else, would, we can just have a chat about this as well. Would everyone, would anyone like to speak to the artists or the works or anything that's coming up from the discussion? One thing that struck me, I'll just have a little talk now while people are thinking. Um, when you're both speaking about anxiety, um, it made me think a lot about the precarious nature of care and how it, I think that's where a lot of that anxiety can come from, is knowing that it's quite a precious thing that isn't um, uh, something that will always be around necessarily. And it's that quality, the ephemeral quality, the preciousness. I think is the anxiety inducing part of it. What are your thoughts on that? Um, yeah, I, I hope I get less anxious <laughs> over time. And yeah, through, through expressing through art or also in um, teaching at university, um, creating, giving readings or having discussions with future emerging designers as well who are going to design spaces like these to host conversations, storytelling, etc. Um, yeah, it gives gives me hope and um, yeah. Sorry, I'm put on the spot. I don't know what. To <laughs> <say>. <laughs> but uh, I think for myself, it's this kind of um, 
anxiety and that unknown because like if you're reaching out with care you don't know necessarily what's on the other end of that kind of um uh, yeah like as um i think of i know this is a weird example but um because my background like i grew up in a household with two german descendant people that like um gesundheit has been a common thing for me to say to people as a instead of god bless you I remember being on a bus at one point and saying Gesundheit to a person and having them freak out at me going, what the fuck did you just say to me? Excuse my language. But, um, <laughs> like, it, it's this interesting thing that, like, acts of care can be received in very different ways. Um, oh, yeah, sorry. Question. Yeah, great question. I mean, it's such a difficult space, isn't it? Um, I remember my partner who grew up on a farm speaking about his mother who had a, um, a, I think it was a cow as well that she had bonded with and eventually they did have to slaughter it because they they were cattle farmers. And um, she cried, cried for days. Like when you have that connection with something, um, it, you know, you really create the meaning. It's a deep emotional, like, severing when you lose something like that, be that an object that's got a lot of emotional qualities to it or um, is invoking of memories or um, a place. Um, yeah, it's, it's fascinating what the brain can do when um, it's allowed to make those really thoughtful, quiet connections, um, particularly... Yes. Exactly. Mm. Yes, and I haven't debriefed with Pam about that, um, but I would be interested to hear how she does reconcile with that. I think because she's very pragmatic, and I think a lot of farmers are in their thinking that they would um, know that the other cattle that they're rearing are treated really well and have beautiful lives, um, at least on her farm. Uh, but I guess their fate is different to the one that she has bonded with. I'm not sure. It's very interesting. It's something that I'm... I'm kind of worms, but <laughs> uh, the categorization and industrialization of emotions and feeling and capital and class, so much of that's coming up with your question for me as well in with Pam's practicality of being able to bond with one, but the others, it's an economic choice as well. So, you know, there's so much complexity there to navigate through. Um, Absolutely. And also they'll be thinking with their own set of ethics in mind, like they're providing for the community of people who are meat eaters um, and giving back in that way as well. And the cows also serve a purpose in that um, process. So it's, it's, it's fascinating, but I don't think it's a simple answer. And it's not a space for it's sort of virtue seeking or anything like that. It's more just um, focusing in on that beautiful sort of generous moment of connection when we do get it. 
And your work does that really beautifully, especially in that spot where it's been installed as well, where it's really looking at that microscopic moment of that connection. Thank yeah, you. Thank you, Priya. Thank you for that question. That was really, yeah, that was brilliant. Uh, would anyone else like to jump in? <laughs> anything, with anything at all? I would say le less intense because uh, through the making of the film and having various opportunities to share it around and uh, just talking to people about what the film is about or what I'm up to, um, you meet people that share the same things. And through my climate activism, I guess I surround myself through people that share those same worries. Um, so it's actually a wholesome experience um, yeah, connecting with others through that. So I would say less less anxious. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, if 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 everyone else is oh, oh yes, um, when you were going through, um, I guess you were. I'm not too sure how you keep track of your dreams, um, but when you were going through the process of that and reflecting on how to put this film together. Was there, there would have all been like a rush of other emotions, not just anxiety. Was there sort of any silver linings through past dreams that you can maybe speak of that unconsciously like came through or? Oh, um, so silver linings. Um, well, the, the piece itself was uh, also had an audio to it. And through sound, I also wanted to ex um, express the tensions. And I had like seismic blasting sounds, for example, and sounds that um, can feel like drowning or not being heard. Um, that's why there's also a shot of me like um, screaming into water, but my voice is being um, like muted. Um, a particular dream. Um, yeah, as I said, it. It's a lot of, yeah, loss or also very, um, a couple of environmental disasters that happen and I might be like with my family or friends and trying to run away or hide or I'm observing tornadoes or things collapsing. Um, yeah. Uh, <laughs> it's hard to like put all the things that I've dreamt into something like that, but I guess I focused on um, the main things, which was this drowning feeling of, yeah. Thank you, Anne. Um, I think on that liminal note of dream processing, <laughs> um, might be a good time to, if there are no more questions in the room, might be a good time to take a break. Um, have uh, please have some tea and some snacks. We will be meeting again in 10 minutes for those who are wanting to stay. Um, we'll see you soon. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you, Henry, Anne, and Jen.